I have made enough money from my YouTube channel in the last ever to be able to afford a proper license for DaVinci Resolve. So thank you to everyone who's watched my videos. I do appreciate it. I appreciate all the nice things people have said in the comments. I do intend to keep making them at semi-irregular intervals. I do intend them to be just as odd as before, if possibly slightly better edited. And remember, the secret is always use an ad blocker. But that's not the important bit. The important bit is that DaVinci Resolve came with one of these. This is a speed editor. It is a dedicated controller for the video editor. It's got buttons, LEDs, and a nice spinny thing. It's really rather nice. The only problem is it only works in DaVinci Resolve. It doesn't work in any other application. Let's see if there's something I can do about that. It's actually a really nice thing. It is plastic, but it's good plastic, and it's reassuringly heavy and stays put when you're working with it. The keys are not double shot, but they are well made and silk screened, and a lot of them have windows to make the underlying LEDs visible. A lot of these features are like toggle things that you select and having an indicator directly on the key is very handy. The key switches themselves are cherry red linears, which I like. The spinny thing here is heavy metal with a rubber friction band around the outside, meaning that moving it rapidly but precisely is very easy. And the indented thing on the top is also very useful. Because this is intended to be used with DaVinci Resolve and nothing else, all the features on the keys are hard-coded to various bits of editor functionality so that this matrix here marked cam 1, cam 2, etc. selects a particular camera when using a multi-cam clip. I can scroll through the timeline of video I'm editing with this thing and if I want to switch to a different camera, I simply hold down the button and move the dial. Painted. Likewise, I can trim the front and end of a clip by holding down trim in, moving the dial and letting go. A lot of the keys have alternate functions, which are labelled on the front of the keys, which you get at through double tapping rather than modifiers. So, you know, escape, undo, very easy. The downside is that all the functions on the keys are hardwired to features in the editor and nothing else. So I mentioned the camera buttons. Thing is, I don't do multi-camera. If you see my videos, I tend to do picture in picture a lot. This means I have to deal with multiple video tracks and it'd be really nice to be able to select a video track using one of the camera buttons, but you can't. And of course, it doesn't work in anything other than DaVinci Resolve. The keyboard actually reports itself as being a USB HID keyboard, except it won't produce events until it's authenticated itself with DaVinci Resolve. And likewise, DaVinci Resolve won't accept keyboard input until it's authenticated itself with the keyboard, which is really annoying. I can think of places where it would be rather nice to be able to use this thing, you know, audio editing, for example or even just as a general purpose macro pad. I mean, the keyboard I use has lots of extra keys, but it's not as nice as this. Okay, let's stop waffling and actually plug it in. So I have this attached next to my real computer. I can insert the plug, LSUSB, and there it is. So now I can do USB HID dump device is 1EDB DAOE and I want to show the event stream. So this is showing events that come from the device. And if I press some keys, nothing happens because the device is not awake yet. Okay. Now, 
I know that running DaVinci Resolve will wake the device up. So I am going to use Wireshark to sniff the USB conversation as that happens and see what it does. So let me just set that up. We are ready to go. I have Wireshark running. Let's fire up Resolve. Now I haven't done this before. Oh, Resolve is talking to the device. I haven't done this before because I wanted to capture the very first conversation in case it did a firmware upgrade. So let's load a project. And there we go. It wants to do the upgrade, so let's tell it to continue. It's doing a thing. Do I need to do something here? What does this button do? Ah, okay. Do the upgrade. Right, it's uploading with the USB DFU protocol, which is a standard USB interface for doing firmware upgrades. This is a good thing. I should be able to pull the firmware image from this dump. And it's finished. Close that. Now, what does the knob do? It is indeed winding back through the timeline. And you can see the LEDs on the device have lit up. Let's put it into shuttle mode. It's a more sluggish than I was really hoping. But you can see here in Wireshark, it's getting lots of communications from the device indicating that I did something on the knob. That's what these things are here. Okay, let's put that into the cut page, which is where this is really supposed to work. Um, ah, that's better. So let's try trimming the output of this. Right, that's not doing anything because I'm not, I'm not turning the knob while I'm pressing the button. But I can see button press packets coming in. When I press the key, I get a packet with this value in it, OA for the first byte of the array. And then when I release the key, I get another event with a zero. Okay, good. That looks like a decent set of data. So let's save that. So now let's have a look at pulling it apart. So I'm looking at the packet dump and I can scroll back to where the DFU protocol starts. And here you can see it uploading, well, downloading by DFU terminology, blocks to the keyboard, each of which is numbered and contains data. If you look at the first ones, we can see here the actual data is 512 bytes per block. This does not look like a embedded device firmware image. This looks like a tar file. The U star root root is very suggestive. That's very odd. And for the second block, I can see here, this must be the, the manifest file described here. So these are probably checksums of the files within the tar file. Block two, yeah. This is the signature for the manifest, manifest.sig. There's the data, keyboard.enc. There's the data. And there's lots of data for that. That's very, very strange. Exporting all the data as a CSV file. The DFU data is this big 
field full of hex. I can then do a bit of scripting to produce a output binary, which turns out to be a tar file, which is extremely interesting. So I can decode it like so. And now we can look at the different files. The fact that this contains two big binaries makes me wonder that this thing may have two microcontrollers in it. However, that does not look like the usual firmware image you see on one of these things. So I think that's compressed or encrypted. Yeah, and this other one looks the same. So I think we've got the firmware image, but it's not actually going to do us any good. So this is the manifest file. These are the lengths of the individual files. And I bet this is a signature. That looks like a load address. So if they are encrypted, the key is already built into the device. So having done some searching around, I believe that these files are in fact encrypted. And decrypting them is basically going to be beyond my abilities unless I get access to the keys. It might be possible to read the firmware off the device. I believe that this keyboard is based on an STM32 and they have pretty lousy firmware protection. But hopefully I won't need to do that. So I'm going to save that for later or hopefully never and move on. So back into Wireshark, I have done a second dump, this time focusing on the USB HID stuff, and you can definitely see patterns. If I, here we go. Here you can see the host, which is the PC, talking to the keyboard. It is looking for report ID one. And then we get the response back from the keyboard with the report ID one data. Now Wireshark is actually doing a fairly poor job of parsing the USB HID packet. So the actual data is the bottom line here, but you can see request response, request response. These, which are side channel asynchronous data packet thingies coming from the keyboard. And then here we have the host talking to the keyboard. It is sending a report of value six. Again, the data is down here in the bottom line. This is 10 bytes, six, zero, all zeros. And we get the response back, basically that it worked. The host then requests a report type six back from the keyboard and we get a response and the keyboard responds with this. And this repeats several times with weird random numbers. So we get a host to keyboard of this keyboard to host 0602 followed by some random junk host to keyboard 0603, some random junk keyboard to host 06045802 and some zeros. Now this is the magic authentication sequence. This is how the keyboard figures out that it's talking to a copy of DaVinci Resolve and how DaVinci Resolve figures out that it's talking to the keyboard. The host starts with all zeros and then fetches back a random number from the keyboard. The host then munges the magic number it's got and sends it back again in this one. Meanwhile, the host sends a random magic number to the keyboard, which is this one, and the keyboard responds with a munged copy of the value. This way, the keyboard can verify that the host is perturbing its number correctly, and the host can verify that the keyboard is perturbing its number correctly. So when you reach the end, the keyboard responds with this fixed value, 
This means that both sides are happy and the keyboard wakes up. And then we start getting keyboard events via the asynchronous interrupt mechanism. Although weirdly, immediately afterwards, and there are some timestamps here, so that's like two seconds apart, the host authenticates again. It's possible that this was me double clicking a project, but I don't think I did. So in order to make the keyboard wake up, we need to somehow fake enough of this to make the keyboard happy. We don't actually care about the other way around. We don't want to be able to verify that we're talking to a real Blackmagic speed editor. We only want the speed editor to think that it's talking to Resolve, which does simplify things slightly. Now, there are two ways of dealing with this. We can either write a program to send random numbers to the keyboard, log all the responses we get, and eventually we should have enough data to reverse engineer the keys, or we go look on the internet to see if someone has already done this. And that brings me to this, because it seems that someone has already done this, including deciphering what all the key codes are, what the various packets that you get from the keyboard look like, where the LEDs are set, and most importantly of all, how the authentication challenge works. And these are the keys, which is slightly disappointing because then I don't get to do all this, but only slightly because this looks really nasty. I do not know where the original author got the keys from. Possibly they managed to dump the firmware. Maybe they just knew about cryptanalysis and reverse engineered them from probing the device. I don't know. But it does save me a great deal of time. What you're looking at here is a boilerplate HID API setup in C++. I've taken one of their standard test programs and made it build. It doesn't do anything currently because it's looking for the wrong device. So let's see what I can do with this. So the device is 1EDB for Blackmagic and DAOE for the speed editor. Um, I do not want to actually write anything just yet. So let's comment all that lot out. Okay, it builds, what happens when I run it? Excellent. We have successfully connected to the device. I don't want that. So now let's add a, a loop where we read some data from the device. We want to dump the result. Do you want to know how much data we've read? Uh, so it returns minus one on error, otherwise the number of bytes read. So we can change that to that. Res equals minus one. The read should not fail because it should block. It should just wait for something to show up. But let's try that. So it builds, we run it, and I've forgotten to turn the camera on, but when I touch the keyboard, nothing happens. That is exactly what we expected. Okay, now I want to do the authentication code. That is over here in the Python code. I think the first thing I want to do is to send the blank packet and get the response back. So I think that is going to be right six naught one two three four five six seven eight ten bytes and read back the result. Actually, the result should be read by that loop, so we don't need that bit just yet. OK, 
Can this actually work? Yes, it can. Okay, so what does this do? Nothing. So what should be happening is that after sending this packet, the keyboard should respond with its challenge. So let's pull up Wireshark again and run this and see what happens. Okay, well, it did something. So I am not sure that's right. I think we should be sending a feature report rather than just raw data. So let me take a look at the HID API, API for that. Yes, there is actually a special function for doing this. HID send feature report. So HID send feature report. And let's change that to HID read feature report. HID get feature report, it's called. Okay, run the program. Interesting. So this returned minus one and it exited. Let's just do a, put that in, yeah. So why is that, it should be blocking. Minus one on error, I bet that we are in non-blocking mode. Doesn't say what, what the default is, but it set non-blocking false. run it. Interesting. Okay, so here is our feature report going out. Six and lots of zeros. Response. Here is our request for the feature, get report, going out. And here is the keyboard's response and the, the keyboard has not returned any data. In fact, the response we get back from the device has got status broken pipe, which I think is the keyboard telling us there is nothing is listening on the other end. Okay, so this is a Wireshark dump of the real traffic. So here goes the all the zeros going out. The host immediately requests a report six. Oh, I know what I'm doing. We need to pre-fill the buffer to tell the keyboard which report we want. So this is going to be naught equals six, one equals naught. Let's try that. Huh. Fire up a new instance of Wireshark. This is a live capture. We run our thing. Stop. Oh, right. Now we get to compare this with what DaVinci Resolve tried. The reason why the address has changed from 314 to 315 is because I unplugged the keyboard and plugged it back in again. Here we have the outgoing request for a report. Sorry, outgoing request to set a report. And here is the data. So it looks like the same data for both programs. Okay, so we then request the report, get report one, W value 306, report type six, report type feature. That looks right. The only difference is that the buffer length is wrong. So then this is returning with an error while this is saying success. Okay, let's try changing this to a 10. See what happens. There you go. Right. It wanted the length of the buffer to be correct. So we are retrieving the same report over and over again. Six, one. Uh, the first byte, the six, indicates that this is part of the handshake. The one is how far through the handshake we've got. So looking at this one, we start the conversation with an outgoing six, zero. The keyboard replies with a six, zero, and its challenge. We reply with a six one. The keyboard replies with a six two. We reply with a six three. 
the keyboard replies with a 6-4. So this, the fact that this is one is strange. Let me try that but look at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, here we go. The first time round, we get a 6-0. The second time round, we get a 6-1. Because we should have replied to the get feature report with a set feature report of our own. Okay, let's... Get feature report, handle, challenge one, ten. very brief error reporting or a checking rather have reset the auth conversation, although that doesn't seem to be working terribly well. We then request the challenge from the keyboard. So looking at the Python code, we have done this. Now we want to send our challenge which we don't care about because we are not going to authenticate the keyboard. So this is we get back a zero, we want to send a one, which we don't care about. The keyboard will then respond with its response to our challenge. Let's just do this to make that clear. So we now want to get the Keyboard response is the wrong phrase, but it may be possible we can do this in a different order because this order doesn't really make very much sense. So that's worked. This is the challenge the keyboard gave us. We then send our challenge and the keyboard responds with this. We don't care about that. We now need to calculate our response to the keyboard's challenge. That's this and therefore this code. And the way it's doing this is it's parsing the value as a little Indian long, which makes perfect sense. So that's Python code, and change this to the 
this. So we take comes is forty fourth odd double. This code should be trivial to change. Uh, it should be a 6040. Roll left. Roll 8N. Here we go. So roll 8 here moves the entire word left by 56 bits. That puts the bottom byte to the top. This looks like a raw, not a roll. I think this is rolling right by one byte. And this just repeats the roll by a certain number of items. Okay, anyway, we can just copy these directly. That's straightforward enough. T4, T roll eight, B. N like that. Wow, I'm actually more and more glad I didn't have to figure this out myself. I mean, the way I would have done it would be to dump the firmware, load it into Ghidra, and then just copy the code there, meaning that I wouldn't actually have to understand what it all meant. Should be relatively easy. Okay, there is our code. I mean, it doesn't work, it doesn't compile, but that's not declared. That needs another set of parentheses. That needs to be well formed. There we go. These need square brackets. Okay, so now I have the routine that does the auth stuff. I need to read the challenge the keyboard gave us, calculate the response and send it. So, believe that's a two at this point. Keyboard response, six zero, we send six one, keyboard send six two, we send six three. So we want to write to the computed response of the 
the challenge that the keyboard gave us. And I've used these two functions, which I will just go away and implement. Okay. So then we want to send feature report handle our response 10. And then we want to read the keyboard response. and print it. And I'm well aware that this, this code is suck. I'm going to refactor it into something a bit nicer in a moment. There we go. Okay, now what happens when we run it? 64882, that looks promising because 6, 4, hex, 5, 8 is 88, 2. Yep, the keyboard has responded saying that it's authenticated and we should be good to go. So let's uncomment this. This wants to be a hid read. And let me just turn the other camera on. Okay. And if I press a key on the keyboard, whoo! We get some stuff out. I mean, it's not happy, it's just failed, but it worked. What happens if I turn the knob? Yep, knob turns. So we're getting a Report four, a report three, a report three, and Smoon out here has very helpfully documented what the various reports do. So key presses are a report four. Setting the LEDs, we do a set report with two. This is four, this one. Pars report three, that's the jog dial. Pars report four is the keyboard. Pars report seven is the battery status, which as I intend to use this thing always plugged in to USB, I don't really care about. Okay, that's excellent. We have the keyboard waking up. Not entirely sure why that failed. But as this works, now would be a good time to rewrite a chunk of this. And I have the nice shiny C++ version with the hid stuff pulled out into a class, the authentication stuff pulled out into a nice small function. So the main loop just looks like this. Open the device, authenticate the device, repeatedly read packets from the device and print them. And the result looks like this. It actually works very much like a USB keyboard. So if I hold down like cam one, you see we get a using my left hand to move the mouse, we get a 04 packet with the key code 33 in it. Let go, we get an 04 packet with nothing. Hold down cam one and cam two, and we get a 33 and a 34, 33, 34, and 35. Let go cam one, 34, 35, 35, etc. So you get up to six keys of rollover. So if I were to do that, it gives us four. Okay, 
Come on. There we go. Yeah. Pressing an, a seventh key causes a new event to arrive, but without an actual key code in it. Spinning the wheel produces O3 packets with a four byte payload, which is the relative position of the wheel. It's actually possible to configure the keyboard into absolute mode. And I believe you do that by writing out a O3 packet. Hang on, I can actually try that. So if I do device dot right, and we want to send a three and a one and five zeros. Uh, that should be send. Using read and write as names in C and C++ programs is a teensy bit problematic because occasionally they are defined as macros in the standard headers. Okay, well, I've done something to it. It's certainly not behaving as it did. Ah, it's showing negative, zero, positive, only. That's interesting. So we change that to mode two. And we get, this is the relative mode we were in previously, I think. So mode three. Interesting. That's the same as mode one. I wonder if these values have anything to do with it. No. Okay, that will require a little bit more experimentation. But what I actually want is relative mode. So not setting this value works. That didn't reset. Hang on, let's put this back the way it was. One, two, three, four, five. Three, four, five, six, seven. Two, three, four, five. Yep. Let's try that. There we go. Back to normal. That's a relief. All right. So we are successfully talking to the keyboard. The next step is to do something with all these keyboard values we're getting. I have taken a break, which is why the window layout is slightly different. And in the process, I've realized I've made a bit of a mistake. The API we're using to talk to the keyboard, HID API, only allows one program to have access to the device at a time. This means that when my program is running, which it currently is, you can see the events coming in, then DaVinci Resolve, which is the other program that wants access to it, can't get at the keyboard. Therefore, my original plan of using my program here to add missing functionality to the video editor just isn't going to work. I can think of a few ways around this, but they're all kind of complicated. DaVinci Resolve does have a public API to allow it to be scripted remotely, so it might be possible to simply deny access to the keyboard using my program here to DaVinci Resolve. And then I basically re-implement everything the video editor does using my program. So that when the user presses a key, my code here sends a command to the video editor and it does it. I don't really want to do that. But the other approach is to create a fake USB device and my program here proxies between the video editor and the real keyboard. This would allow me to inject key events, which would be picked up by the video editor. I think this is much more plausible, but I don't actually know how to create virtual USB devices. And I think that's getting a bit complicated. 
So I'm actually going to take the third option, which is to pretend that I was never intending to make this work in the video editor entirely, and instead just treat it as a simple macro pad, because it's much easier and achieves quite a lot of what I actually wanted. So let's start work on parsing the incoming packets. We're going to deal with the keyboard first. Here are some incoming keyboard packets, and each one is a four byte followed by up to six key presses as little endian ints. And each packet tells us the current state of the keyboard. So this packet says that keys 36, 37, and 38 are pressed. This packet says that keys 36 and 37 are pressed. Therefore, we know that 38 must have been released. We actually need to keep track of the state of each key in order to tell whether they've been pressed or released. So that's actually not too hard. Let's do some code. So for each key press, We want to get 16-bit integer from the incoming packet data. Actually, we want to get the set of keys which are currently pressed. We are going to put together the current state of the keyboard. So this is... that. That's not going to build because I haven't included set. And we need to implement get in 16. So now when we run it and I press a key, we get nothing. The jog wheel still produces three packets. So we are putting together the, the new state of the keyboard. We want to keep a global map that will be here somewhere. This will be the previous state of the keyboard. So now we can compare the two sets any key which is in the new state must have just gone down. Any key which is in the old state but not the new state must have just come up. So we want to do a set difference. Let me go and look up how this works in C++ again. Here it is. It's pretty ugly because it's C++. I really hate all these STL iterator base functions. But anyway, we're going to do, oh yeah, we need to do include algorithm set difference between the first, which is the old state In keyboard state end and the new keyboard state begin end. No, that's not right. This doesn't just return an iterator, it actually fills in another vector. So in this example, this computes the set difference between first and second tier and puts the result in this vector. That's foul. I wonder if there's a better way of doing this using ranges. 
Yes, there is. Let's do that instead. Okay. So we want a output set is pressed. We are going to compute the set difference between the current state and the new state and put the result into our keys pressed state, our keys pressed set. Okay, is that going to build? Uh, stood ranges has not been declared. Yeah, I forgot to tell the build system that this is a C++20 file. And this needs to be probably std inserter. No. Having looked it up, I forgot to put a begin in here. Wait, what? Okay, like that. So now I should just be able to do for mint 60t pressed key down like that. And I run it. And of course it doesn't work. Yeah, um, I also forgot to do current keyboard state equals new keyboard state. It is reporting key ups, not key downs. Therefore, these parameters are backwards. So this wants to be new keyboard state, current keyboard state. Right, good, that's working. Uh, we did get that zero at the top. This is because I forgot to check that the key code might be zero. So let's just pull that out. Like so. Press a key. So we've got key downs. And then we do exactly the same thing but the other way around for released keys. This was the thing that we'd figured out earlier. Press, release, press, release. Press release. Yep, that is working. Let's try multiple keys. Press, 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 press. Release, 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 release. Excellent. The next step is to actually do something. The simplest thing is to just map each of the speed editor's keys to a X keyboard key, you know, like function keys or something. And the simplest way of doing that is with a library called libfakekey that I am actually using for my Narcissus Cordian keyboard program. So let me just find the code. 
like this. And put that there, much better. Okay, and I also need to change the build script. to include the, to link against lib fake key. And then we can start using it. Now lib fake key works with X. So we need to set up a X connection. So we are going to need this stuff as well. And we need to do the ritual of actually opening the X connection. So look at the main function. Here we go, main. Let's open and display null. This code over here is in C, not C++. We don't care about the X input selection, but we do want to open a window. And set up a fake key instance. This is important because as we are faking key up and key down events, if the program quits with a key held down, that key will never be released. But we're going to do that here. Yeah, you can't use a lambda in the place of a function pointer if it captures something. So that will work, but I now cannot access these variables. So I actually just need to make these globals, including the current keyboard state. So Okay, so our at exit code here now has access to the set that tells us which keys are pressed so that we can release them. And in fact, there seems to be a function that does exactly that in libfakekey. So all we need is that. Okay, so here we can actually start pressing and releasing keys. And that's pretty straightforward. We just do fake key press key sim. Fake key modifier mask is zero currently. No, wait, that should have the key sim in it. So let's just do this for now. Uh, how do you release keys? That releases all keys. Actually, it looks like fake key release here releases all pressed keys. 
That's not really what I want. Okay, I'm going to look this up. From looking at the implementation, it seems that libfakekey only supports having one pressed key at a time, which is not what I wanted. So I think in order to fix this, we're just going to do with, go with if the keys release set is not empty, release all the keys. Okay, so run it and press a key. You can get repeat keys, it works. However, with only one key pressed at a time, rollover works very badly, as you can see. So I don't think that lib fake key is gonna work for me. I think I'm gonna have to do things the hard way, which means basically re-implementing a lot of what this has got. That's annoying. Let me look to see how this works. Turns out that libfakekey does actually have a way of doing this, which is we're using the function fakey send key event. You get to specify whether it's pressed or not, but it's annoying because it works with key codes rather than with key sims, because the way that X handles keyboards is really annoying. Okay, so what we want to do is let's add a function press release key and this is going to take a key sim a pressed flag and the modifier flags So what this needs to do is it needs to convert the key sim to a key code. And this is the display. Like that. And if there is a matching key code for that key sim, we can then call fake lib What's it called? Press key, send key, send key event. Fake key, send key event. Fake key, code, pressed, flags. So here, this becomes press release key. K plus 65 true zero. And this becomes press release key K plus 65 false zero. And that needs to be keys released. And we need to change this because we're no longer using that bit of fake key. So this wants to be TK in current keyboard state. Okay, let's see what this does. Press, press. Yeah, much better. It's doing rollover correctly. Good. Of course, it's not very useful because it's just sending random keys. For a decent macro pad, you want to be able to send either function keys that can be trapped by particular applications. For example, I'm using KDE here so that I can add global shortcuts. Or you want to run commands. I could run commands directly from this program, but it would actually be easier to have this send special function key sequences, and then the mapping from that to a command happens elsewhere. So all this program does is it makes the keyboard work. 
Okay, so we're going to change this from keysim to a Unicode code point. These get mapped to X keysims by just adding a value on to the Unicode code point. And there is actually, here we go, this value. So we actually want to do keysim equals Unicode or with that. And this should actually work in exactly the same way as before. Except it's not. Okay, it's not working because my current keyboard mapping does not have any mapping for these Unicode values. LibFakeKey works around this by deliberately remapping part of the keyboard on the fly so that the key that gets pressed, the virtual key that gets pressed, has the desired mapping to the Unicode value. It would be nice if we could use fake keys implementation of this, but we can't. So we're going to have to copy this. So we need to read the X keyboard mapping, which happens here. In fact, we can probably use the implementation inside fake key. No, we can't because the fake key state is opaque, which means we can't get access to any of this stuff. So we're just going to have to do this the hard way. Great. Here is the actual implementation. Why can't I select that? Okay. So this is fetching the, the range of key codes. The key codes are the platform specific codes that describe the keyboard. Then we fetch the key sims. The key sims are the platform independent mappings. So what we end up with is an array indexed by key code of which key sim is defined for each key code. Okay, so that my keyboard here, the mapping has 255 minus eight keys. And we want a last modified key for zero. We're going to use the last 10 keys of the key map. This is what libfake key does. Here is the remapping code. This actually wants to go here. So if not, that means that these variables all need to be global. And I'm going to rename those later to be to match our coding style. In the main, this wants to be key sims. This wants to be last modified keys. So this will cycle around the last 10 keys. 
uh, rather the last 10 slots in the keyboard map. We then change the keyboard mapping so that the key that we want has that particular key sim. And then we update the keyboard map. Sync. And our new key code is going to be index plus min key code. Okay. So now let's try it. I'm not sure that's working. B, C, D, E, no F, press it again, I get an F. This suggests that this is not correct. So in fact, let's just do this again. Okay, so that is now working once more. And, but now we're sending arbitrary Unicode values. So if I were to change this to 256, we want to change that as well, otherwise we won't do, we won't generate the right key up events and then press things. Yep, there we go actual Unicode stuff. Mm. Why have I done that? Well, I want to send Unicode because the standard X key sim table, that is the set of keys that X expects to be on the keyboard, does have function keys, it's got 35. My speed editor here has got 47 keys and I don't want to map them to function keys because my real keyboard already has function keys. Instead, I am going to send special Unicode values in the user defined area. With luck, I should be able to use these as keyboard shortcuts inside Kwin. And I know that they won't overlap with the real function keys. So rather than have this take a Unicode value, I'm actually going to have a key num. So key num will be the key, actually that's going to be an int, the key number according to the speed editor. And then we're going to add on the start of the Unicode user area, which I shall have to go and look up. There are three user areas. We're going to use this one. So that's going to be OX, uh, that's going to be OX EOO. So now the reason why we put the map in here is so that I don't have to change all these three, all these three things in lockstep. So that builds, we run it. And what happens when I press a key? We get weird stuff, that's good. Let me just fire up XEV. This displays X events. Uh, nothing's happening. Oh, <laughs> that's because I just control C'd the program, that's why. Okay, let's run XEV in this terminal. Now try it. There we go. So here's one of the events you can see. Here's the key sim. 
that we computed in our code up here, there is the Unicode value. Good, good. And, huh, uh, I think that's all there was to it. Okay, let's try go up to, let's go up to the KDE shortcuts editor, find Kwin, uh, actually no, let's find custom shortcuts. See, I create a console if I press shift and this is tools is actually one of the special keys on my real keyboard. So let's add a trigger for your RxVT. So oh blast. These keys aren't working in the with this. Well, I figured it out and it was really stupid. System settings here will, will not let you set printable characters to be shortcuts. So I can't set A, I can't set Shift A, but I can set Alt A. So we apply and it works. And because my keypad here is generating printable Unicode characters, system settings was not accepting them. What I can do is hold down Alt on the keyboard and then the main key. And look, it's bound a shortcut. It looks weird because there's just some random glyph attached, but it's worked. There's only one slight problem. It doesn't work. It looks like the extra keys are mapped straight to text entry and not going through whatever layer is doing the global shortcut stuff, which is a shame. So for this to be at all useful for keyboard shortcuts, I need to make sure that this like works and also that the keys being generated by the macro pad have a modifier set. Let's actually, let's change this back to, uh, let's actually just change this to our 65 and take off the Unicode modifier. Uh, oh yeah, in the process of figuring out what was going wrong, I cleaned up a lot of this code. We don't need to keep the entire key mapping because this function will let us change one key at a time. Okay, so uh, key code, code equals x, key sim, key code. Yeah, I did actually have this logic in there. I am just putting it back again. And this wants to be X key code. Key code with a capital C. Okay, so that will now, I have to quit that. That will now generate alphabetic keys. So, interesting. Why is that generating lowercase? Oh yeah, I haven't set any modifiers here. All right, so let's fire up system settings again. Shortcuts, custom shortcuts, console, trigger. Right, let's bind out B. That's just detected it correctly. Apply out B. Okay. So it looks like you just can't bind keyboard shortcuts to keys with high Unicode values. So I am going to have to change this to generate alphabetic keys. But because in order for the shortcuts to work, they have to have modifiers anyway, 
that's actually not a problem because they won't collide with any existing keys, provided we can generate the right set of modifiers, of course. Luckily, X has a lot of modifiers. So we have shift, shift lock is special, control, mod one, which is alt and meta, mod two, which is num lock, mod three, which is compose keys and such, as is mod five and mod four is super. So I should be able to easily generate keys with more modifiers than makes sense. So I can bind to control, come on, control, shift, super, alt, A. No sane person is going to want to type that, but then if I do control, shift, meta, alt, A, it works. So let's just do that. And luckily, lib fake key will generate the modifiers for me. So I just have to look up what those are. The results are horrifyingly simple. The way it does it is before typing any keys, it just fakes key presses to the modifiers, which is something. Okay, what can we do about this? We need to press the modifiers before any key press happens and then release them after any key ups happen. So if keys pressed is not empty, uh, let's actually do this the other way around. If If the current keyboard state is empty, no keys pressed, but some keys are being pressed, press the modifiers. Then press or release the keys. Then if the current keyboard state is not empty and uh, this actually wants to be new keyboard state and the new keyboard state is empty release the keys right and the way we're going to do that is fake key is the key to the handle this is the key code he's in to key code, we want to press control L, true, zero. And this wants to be the same thing, but release. Why is that not? Oh, yeah. that works. So now when we press something, let me see, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, control J. Yep, that works. K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R. Good. So now let's do the same with out. Why does that say out? That should say control. Out. Meta. So what's this going to do? 
That has, in fact, horribly screwed up my keyboard. You see, if I press Control, Shift, Windows, Alt, does that put it back? Yes, it does. Good. Okay, we can clean this up. So let's see, const. Um, X cage, not hit shift, control L, X K out L. XK meta L. So I'm actually a bit concerned that this might not work. Libfake key has lots of weird codes that go and look at the modifier table. I think it's trying to figure out which modifier keys are mapped to which modifiers. Here it is. Because if you happen to have, is there a Super? There is a super. Yeah, let's just try that. And this wants to be true. So that will just be bool pressed, and then we do for keysim keysim in modifiers, and then one of these. And then this wants to be the keysim, and this in fact does not want to be an X, so. Fire up our tool, stick it in the background, bring up XEV, and then press a key and see what happens. Okay, so I see that super got pressed, then Z got pressed, then super got released. I think I need to do a flush because this code is doing that. Actually, I think send key event does that. Yes. Let's put it in any way and see what happens. And that wants to be display. Press key. There you go. You can see if I move the mouse, that will all scroll away. You can see that control, alt, and super have all been released with key release events. Excellent. So let's bring up this again, custom shortcuts, console trigger. Let's assign, no modifier, I'm just pressing a key. Meta control alt B, good. So apply that, press the button, and there comes my console. Brilliant, it's working. Now I didn't press shift for a reason, because we've got 47 keys, there aren't enough alphabetic keys. So I'm going to have to use shift to distinguish between them. The actual key numbers go one, two, three, four, five, six, down this way. Then there's a gap. Then they start again from here and then to here. I'll actually make this print the numbers again. Uh, Go. If pressed, not print. So 
So this is key one. Oh, I'm starting lots of consoles. Two. That's not good. All right, what that's done is that shift control alt c is not a known modifier and it's showing up in the console as a control c so i need to press control shift meta out and my keyboard goes back to normal um really i want these things to be ignored if they don't have a mapping now i thought i had Meta C map to close a window. Apparently I don't. It hasn't printed the C. Control Meta C. Right. Control seems to take priority. So C with no modifiers. Alt C does nothing. That did just close the window. That was Meta C. So that's a bit problematic. I've done some experimenting. It looks like using combinations of meta and alt with alphabetic keys plays havoc with terminals. So that's just not gonna work. So either I have to go back to using the Unicode stuff, which I also know won't work, or I'm gonna have to use the function keys. That's annoying, I don't wanna do that because the function keys are already used for various shortcuts. Does, here we go, restart debugging, control shift F5. I think I can probably get away without meta and the function keys. I think that's the only thing that will work. Anyway, I also need to change my at exit here to press release modifiers, false, release all the modifiers. So this wants to be XKF, is there an F naught? There is not, X key, XKF1. And the modifiers being set are basically all of them. Let's see how that goes. Press a key. Oh yeah, you probably didn't see what happened there. I'll need to check up on the video, but it turns out that pressing Control, Shift, Alt, and Function key in Linux changes virtual console. So let's just change our modifiers not to hold down Control. Let's try that again. Right, press key, receive, number. So there you can see the gibberish that's being produced on the terminal for the function keys plus the key numbers. So this goes down to 17 over here. And then this skips up to 49. 31. Okay. Clearly black magic have rearrange some of the keys. This takes not a great deal of sense. And these numbers are low as well. Here is Smoonort's table of what the keys actually mean. And you can see that they go up monotonically. There's a gap between smooth cut, that's this one, and then source and timeline, which are up here, then shuttle, jog and scroll. Then sync bin here. And the highest key is stop play at 3C, AKA 60. So that is too many. So I'll need to do some kind of clever mapping. Right, strict key mapping. Actually, this is easier than that. This is a map between key number and 
the key sim we want to generate and whether it's shifted or not. So key one is smart insert and this becomes a XKF1 false. Good, and that compiles. So I just need to go and add lots of entries to this. Be back in a moment. Here is the table and it even compiles. So now I just need to do something with it. So let's go down to press release key and I need to fetch the appropriate value out of the key map. If the key doesn't have a mapping, ignore it. So the key sim is going to be first and if second is set, press shift. K shift L pressed yes flags. Actually, I can use the flags we're not using here at all. So I can just do it second fake key mod shift otherwise zero. Get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. We should be ready to go. No, we're not. Ah. Uh, actually, second, first. Yeah, that's not great. That could be clearer. I should have made an actual structure for this. Okay, that builds. Fire it up, press a key, did a thing. Fire up, quick settings, shortcuts, custom shortcuts, console, trigger. Meta Alt F1, that's just what you wanted. Meta out shift F22, that's just what I wanted. So I hit apply. Now if I hit stop play, we get a console. Brilliant. It now works as a macro pad. I haven't done the twiddly thing. It's unclear what to map that to actually. I'll have to think about that, but it's now pretty late. So I am gonna take a break and come back. I was vaguely thinking of trying to map the spinny thing to a pointer axis, but it looks like Xtest doesn't support this. You can fake motion and you can fake relative motion, but you can only supply X and Y axes. So I think I'm just going to go for the simple approach and simulate the mouse scroll wheel. This works by just sending button four and button five for up and down. So scrolling up, button four, scrolling down, button five, which is honestly not the smoothest, but it should work. 
All right, so the way the spinny thing works is it sends signed relative deltas. If I spin it clockwise, you get positive numbers in these four bytes. If I spin it anti-clockwise, I get negative numbers. Therefore, you want to read keyboard packets, uh, mouse packets, wheel packets. And the value is a signed int 32, which comes from 32 bits in starting from the from byte number two zero one two don't know what this trailing one is but this zero appears to be the mouse i keep saying mouse wheel mode so zero is relative so let's just print that Spin the thing. There we go. Negative numbers, positive numbers. The numbers are all quite big, but no matter. Right, what I'm going to do is keep track of the current wheel position. and update it every time we get a packet in. So now I spin it to the right, and the number keeps going up. I spin it to the left, the number goes down again. Let me do this. What I'm going to do is accumulate data until the wheel has moved a certain distance in either direction and then send a button event. So um, Wheel position minus sent wheel position Okay, so if the total delta is greater than a certain value, the total delta here is the difference between the last time we sent a button event and we are going to do real step, let's call that a thousand to start with. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Then I want to figure out which button it is. Um, so figuring out which is the larger number is actually not as easy as it might be because we're expecting this to roll over. So we might start with a very large number and our number here is signed. So let's go with this. This is large. So this is plus, let's call it seven. We add on one. What we end up with is, let's make that two for purposes of example. We end up with this, which is actually a negative number. I think that's minus seven, but it doesn't really matter. 
So just comparing before and after, this one and this one will not give us the right results. So I want to get rid of the abs here because I need to preserve the sign. We put the abs in there. So the button is going to be four mouse up if the wheel is rotated anti-clockwise. If it's rotated anti-clockwise, then this means that wheel position is going to be smaller than sent wheel position. Therefore, total delta will be negative. Otherwise, we want button five, which is scroll down. We also want to adjust sent wheel position accordingly. So if total delta is negative, we're just sending one button. So we want to adjust that by that, otherwise by that. Okay. So now we can send the button event, X test fake button event. Display button, uh, that's button, it is pressed, zero delay. Make sure that gets flushed and release the button. However, the wheel might rotate more than one wheel step in a packet. So we want to do this in a loop. I will actually flip this. If it's less than wheel step, just stop. Otherwise, send the event. So we simply loop around this, sending button ups or button downs until the sent wheel position is close enough to wheel position and then stop. Let's give this a try. Um, I will actually insert some tracing in here, I think. Okay, let's give this a go. Scrolling the wheel. And well, my my console is scrolling. That's that's actually working just fine. The tracing is not very useful because it's printing the tracing into the window that it's scrolling. So let's move the mouse over here. Hang on. I need to make sure. Right, that's interesting. Make sure the focus is at the end. Now I can scroll. You can see that that's working. It's, it's very abrupt. I need to increase wheel step. And it's also doing weird things to my mouse focus. Hmm. Okay, let's change that to factor of 10. No, hang on. I want to make this smaller. No, I want to make it bigger. <laughs> if you've been watching my channel for a while, you will know what I'm like with numbers. So scroll. That's better. In fact, it doesn't need to be very quick because this thing is so easy to spin rapidly. Well, let's get rid of the tracing. Yeah, you see, the focus is not moving between windows anymore. I have to click. No, I don't. I had to press a key before the focus would move. Um, I think this is not 
working quite right. I think the button is staying down for some reason. Let's put that in. Let's see if that makes a difference. And let's slow this down again. Scroll. Okay, that is too slow. But it is working. What about the mouse focus? Yes, that is better. Okay, clearly I needed the, uh, that X sync. So let's just change that to that. That's probably a reasonable compromise. Yeah, that feels good. And let's try it in the web browser. Right, the web browser scrolls much more quickly. Now, the interesting thing is that I actually use a X extension. If I can find it, let's start, here we go. I use a feature called button scrolling. What this does is it emulates the mouse wheel by holding down a mouse button. In this case, I have it mapped to the right mouse button. So I can hold that down and drag, and I get very natural scrolling. It's much easier than actually using the mouse wheel. This is scrolling with the mouse wheel. This is just a single motion of my hand. And if I do it here, I remember this as being slower. Possibly it's because I have the font size cranked up for the recording. But that is clearly doing exactly the same thing as the wheel, which I killed here. So I reckon that's normal. Let me put that back to normal size. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So I was thinking that button scrolling might not have the problem where different applications would scroll different amounts, but it clearly does. Good. So let me just format that. And you know what? I think it's done. No, wait, it's not done. There are in fact two very important things I need to do. The first one of which is of course to make the LEDs work. That's done by sending a to report from the host to the device. Where is it? Set report, output report to, takes a single 32-bit bit field. So that should be send to if, 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 if. And Right, after trying that again, but this time with the keyboard actually plugged in, you can see that all the LEDs light up. So good, the LEDs are being handled. The other important thing is that even though we've authenticated the device here, the keyboard will actually forget its authentication periodically and you have to re-authenticate. So we actually need to repeat this every 60 seconds or so which is fantastically annoying because now we have to do receive here with a timeout. Okay, how does this work? We're calling hid read. We want to put, uh, let me go look this up. Okay, there is a hid read timeout that takes a milliseconds parameter and it returns zero if nothing got read. So we want to put timeout milliseconds. Uh, let's actually do that milliseconds timeout. We want to put the timeout here. If res is zero, that means that no data is available. So we want to error out, but we're returning the data packet as our error. 
So let's just add an exception. Hit read timeout. So timeout exception. Okay, so this now needs to take the timeout. And the thing is, we need to accumulate the timeouts because we can't just wait for 60 seconds because we may get multiple events within our minute window. And if we're going to reset the timer after each one, that's just not going to work. So we're going to have to do int milliseconds timeout. Start that. Timeout milliseconds is 60 seconds times a thousand. Uh, timeout milliseconds, yes, I have to spell that correctly. So this becomes that. And we have to wrap this in a exception handler. So if we get data, this will return and we go through this code path. If we get a timeout, then we want to reset the timer authenticate and go around again. Why does that want a parameter? Device, authenticate device. And let's just stick some tracing in here. Let's print authenticated. Okay, now this is not gonna work because there's another bit we need. That is, after doing the receive, we need to know how long we waited so we can adjust the timeout correspondingly. And in fact, let's actually do this differently. If MS timeout is less than zero, do that. So if we get a timeout, we just clear the timer to zero. Uh, we clear the timeout to zero, thus forcing this code path to be taken, which both resets our timer and does the authentication. And up here, we want to measure, oops, measure how long this receive took and subtract that from the timer. Now, how to get the current time in C is tricky. You've got to fiddle around with CPU clocks and stuff like that. But there may be a C new C++ standard way of doing it. Let me check. Yes, there is. It's part of the new Chrono library. So let's include that. So what we need to do is, and it's pretty annoying, we need to fetch the current time before and after the operation and subtract them. And the current time in the Chrono library is this ridiculous type, but luckily this is C20, so we can just do std chrono steady clock now, if I remember correctly. Std chrono steady clock now, yep. No, wrong button. So that then lets us put this afterwards which means that we can then do this ridiculous thing to convert the two 
times into a microseconds value, which of course is not an int. It's a std chrono duration. So I believe the way it works is it counts ticks. And the std chrono microseconds type uses a microsecond as a tick. And in fact, we didn't want microseconds, we wanted milliseconds. So I now need to get the number of ticks out of the representation. So that's count. So let's actually do int delay that print delayed for so then I can do ms timeout minus equals delay. Okay, so that will slowly count down this until it reaches zero and then it will reauthenticate. So it builds, we run. So now if I do a thing, we see over here, oh, I forgot to change the size of that terminal. There we go. We see over here that there was a delay of 3000 milliseconds. Then the key down happened. Then a delay of 56 milliseconds and the key up happened. And I will put In as well. We run that again. So, oops. in fact, so you can see MS timeout slowly going down. You can see that when I spin the wheel, we get events that are 24 and 15 milliseconds apart, which is interesting. Seems to be very regular. So I now just have to wait until that times out. And there it reauthenticates. Excellent. So now I can get rid of that and put that up here. Okay. Right, now it's done. In fact, I'm not very satisfied with it. There were too many compromises. I don't like the way it uses function keys. I don't like the way that the wheel doesn't map to a proper axis. In the process of writing it, I discovered uInput, which is a Linux API for creating low-level input devices from software. So that with this, I can just, you know, create my own base level device, inject event directly into it, and then X or Wayland or whatever you're using will just pick up events from that. It gets added as a X input device, one of these. So that would, I think, be rather more satisfactory. I bet there will still be edge cases that we'll need dealing with, but I think it would work better than what I currently have here. In particular, having to inject modifier keys is just vile. I do have a computer that is missing a meta key. That's the Windows key. And because I use meta a lot for my everyday work, I have that mapped to something else. Because we're injecting physical key code, this doesn't know about that mapping. So it's going to be pressing the wrong key. But I'm not going to be using this program on that computer. I'm only going to be using it on this desktop. And it works fine here. And there you have it, Linux software for turning a Blackmagic speed editor into a macro pad. Rather badly written. At some point, I am going to rewrite that to use uInput. It won't work in any other systems, but oh well. Incidentally, all the lights are on because I've just had it plugged into my PC and it's still running on battery. When the authentication expires, it will turn itself off and all the lights will go out. So, all the software has been uploaded to GitHub. See the description for links. 
I don't imagine it will be particularly useful for anybody, but nevertheless, there it is. It's been a while since I've done a programming video. It's quite nice to get back to them. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments. And also, I have actually done some of the editing with this already, and this thing is amazing for editing. Now I have to go and do the rest of it.